Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Chag Sameach. Happy Passover to you and to your family. Before we get into part two of our message from last week, I just want to spend a few moments uh, talking about the Passover and honestly what it what it means to me, why it's so special. For me personally, I can tell you this is my favorite holiday. This is my favorite festival of any of the festivals. Uh, this receives a, a a pride of place in my heart, if you will. And actually, if, if you look at the Torah, it does in the Torah. This festival is exalted above all the other festivals. In fact, this is the first one. None of the other festivals happen. They don't come to pass without this one first coming to the table. And in fact, there are requirements, even with this Passover, that you don't see listed with any of the other festivals. But you do with Passover. See, this, it's interesting, this was the, the festival that, that states in Exodus 12 that if there's a stranger or foreigner and they want to keep the Passover to the Lord, they want it. There's something within them. They covet this. They yearn for it. And we know why that would be. They want to be saved. They want salvation. And so with this festival, there's specific requirements that, hey, you're going to come in. You want to observe this? You need to become circumcised, and you will become as a native of the land. And you think of how profound that is. Here you have strangers and foreigners being able to come as one with Jewish people, as one with the Hebrew and their God. And that, that is an amazing thing, which then, of course, all the other festivals would just fall into line. And so there's, there's aspects to this festival that are so profound. Uh, in fact, the festival's considered to be so important that this is the only festival that carries a provisional observance. None of the other feasts, if, if you miss Shavuot or if you miss uh, Rosh Hashanah, you miss one of those, there's no provisional observance. There is with Passover. This is not even optional. It's not an option to miss this. You had to observe it. It was critical. If you're not going to observe this festival, we're told in the Torah, you're going to get cut off. You need to observe this. And so there's a provisional observance in Numbers chapter 9. Listen, if, if you don't make it uh, to in, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, uh, the first month, then you can observe this on the 14th um, day of the month at twilight in the second month which interestingly enough still happens before Shavuot. So none of the other festivals are to be observed until this one is observed. This one, this is the one we've, we've got to get right. This is the one where it all began for Israel. It's with the Exodus and the Pesach lamb. So this is an extremely meaningful time. Well, since we are eating unleavened bread for seven days, I thought I'd share a quick passage with you, and this is from Exodus 13, verse 7. And we read this Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And so, obviously, this is the time we get all the leaven out, which at times scripture equates it to sin. And we think about this at, during this time, uh, and we think about how Israel. They ate unleavened bread because they were pushed out of Egypt in haste. They didn't have time to take provisions. They didn't have time to wait for it to leaven. They were pushed out. And so we think about that reality, and in all that, God took care of them. See, the moment, Passover is about faith. It's about fully trusting in God's provision in your life. An amazing thought. And this is, this is what should be coming to our mind as we eat this unleavened bread. Continuing on, verse 8, And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. Isn't that fascinating? Our observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we just simply call Passover now, where we don't eat unleavened bread for seven days, is to bear witness to our children. It's to bear witness to our friends, to our family. And what is that witness? We are testifying of what Yeshua has done for us. There's no other reason I do this than the fact that the Lord has had mercy upon his people. And remember what Yeshua said in Luke 22. He said, do this 
meaning the Passover. If you're going to celebrate Passover, do this in remembrance of me. So why do we eat unleavened bread? Why do we eat matzah during this time? Because, number one, the Lord commanded us, and we want to bear witness to what he has done for us. And so this is a memorial. This is a testimony he has instructed us to observe. This is a mark he wanted to leave for the world to witness. And that's interesting because the very next verse says this, it shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. Now, for those of you who have been prophecy buffs and you study the mark of the beast your entire life, this is going to this is going to stick out because when we think of a sign on our hand or on our forehead, we think of the mark of the beast, but interestingly enough, this is the very place the mark of the Lord also goes. So, in essence, you either bear the mark of the beast or you're going to bear the mark of the living God. And isn't it interesting that this phraseology is attached, it's affixed to the festival of Passover. That's all about the Pesach lamb. And we eat this unleavened bread because of what Yeshua has done for us. To have that confession, to have that testimony, that is part of of the mark of the Lord. And and again, you can go to Revelation, and it, and it says, The dragons enraged with the woman goes to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of the Messiah, Yeshua. A fascinating point is the only time, all the other time you find this type of phraseology in the Torah is affixed explicitly to the commandments of God. And so here we see it's really affixed to the testimony and the observance of the Lamb. This is why we, the blood of the Lamb, the whole point of Passover, the star of Pesach of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Lamb. And the other time that we see this terminology, uh, you shall bind it as a sign in your hand and frontless between your eyes are with the commandments of God. And so this is, this is powerful. This is a powerful time of year. And then it goes on and says that the Lord's Torah may be in your mouth for with a strong hand or for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. See, when we do these things that the Lord has instructed, when we confess Yeshua as the Messiah, his Torah is in our mouth. And it's so fascinating I mean, how the Christian, how the devil has distorted the Torah, the Lord's law, in their minds by, by literally selling them this idea that, hey, if you accept Christ, Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you have to forsake the law. You have to abandon it. It's actually just the opposite. Those who receive Jesus into their heart, the Lord's Torah goes in their mouth. This is what will come out of their mouth because he writes their laws, Jeremiah 31. He will write his Torah on their hearts and they would do his commandments. And so with that said, I just want to leave you with those thoughts during this time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, let's get back to part two of our message. Bless you. Amen. All right, now getting back to our story and, and I'm not going to get into this, but the fourth brother dies, the fifth brother dies, the sixth brother dies. It's all recorded in the Maccabees. And each one of them makes a statement that you can just take right back to Scripture. I mean, that's the thing about all these brothers. Every time something comes out of their mouth, it's spiritually profound. Something you can grab hold of, something that gives strength, that's anointed with spirit that you can find in Scripture. Uh, beautiful things. But then the last brother comes on the scene. This is the youngest. He's number seven, the number of perfection. Verse 24, we read, The youngest brother, being still alive, Antiochus not only appealed to him in words, but promised with oaths that he would make him rich and enviable. So now he ups the ante. Okay, so torture, intimidation. You just saw your six brothers be put to death. Let that sink in for a moment while I pitch this. I will make you rich. I will make you famous. I will give you honor. Everything that Antiochus could possibly give him, he is offering. 
wealth, fame, it all. It goes on. If he would turn from the ways of his ancestors and that he would take him for his friend and entrust him with public affairs. So it's not just about fame and honor. I'm going to give you authority. People will answer to you and you will be considered in my arena, in my circle of friends. Like I said, everything that could be possibly put on the table is put on the table before this young man. And this is after he's had to watch his six brothers be tortured. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine what would happen with just one brother and how you would go stark raving numb over what's happening. But to see what he's experienced today, no description to that. You can't even put that into words. Now, continuing on, how does this young man to respond? I mean, the nightmare can end right here. All he needs to do is compromise. Verse 25, we read this. Since the young man would not listen to him at all, the king called the mother to him and urged her to advise the youth to save himself. You want to talk about, okay, so first, intimidation and fear, bodily persecution. He's recognizing that might not work. So now it's going to be the fame, the riches, the wealth, the honor, the authority, everything. I'm going to do that. It's not working. Now he calls the mom. This this gets intense. In verse 26, we read this. After much urging on his part, she undertook to persuade her son. Now you think about this. Let's, let's talk about mom for a second before we continue here. Mom has been through a living hell that no mother could possibly handle. She's just watched her six sons before her own eyes butchered. Uh, how, how, how do you even respond to that? Other than now she's being given an opportunity by the king to talk to her last son. It's her only son left. Talk sense into him. Do you see how wickedly brilliant the devil is and now he is scheming he's moving multiple pieces together that it all seems to make perfect sense and man this is the most vulnerable point of this story and how could it get more right and so get mom involved and certainly mom is not going to be willing to lose her last son and certainly this youngest one is going to adhere to the love of his mother Listen to how this plays out, because she's going to come. She, she's, she's willing to come and talk to her son. But this is what she says. It's going to go a little different than you might think. But leaning close to him, she spoke in their native language as follows, deriding the cruel tyrant, meaning Antiochus. My son, so she's speaking to her son, my son, have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb, and I nursed you for three years, and and have reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you, I beg you, my child, to look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. And in the same way, the human race came into being. This mother is anointed with the Holy Spirit. She is speaking Holy Spirit right now. It's just flowing out of her mouth. This is just amazing. Verse 29, Do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death, so that in God's mercy, I may get you back again along with your brothers. This did not go the way the Antichrist wanted it to go the way the spirit of the devil wanted to go. Look at this mother's faith. She knows that the only possible way she can retain her son is if he gives his life. That he maintains obedience because she knows that she knows that she knows there is a resurrection of the dead. Just as Mary knew and as Martha knew as they listened to Yeshua's teaching as he told them there is a resurrection at the last day all are going to rise up and even when Lazarus was dead Martha tells him I know my brother will rise at the last day she knows it this mother knows 
that she will get her son for all eternity if he follows the Lord. This is faith. This is faith that is so moving and so powerful. This, this transforms people when you hear about this and their resolve. This is the kind of people the writer of Hebrews is talking about. In chapter 11, this is the kind of faith all these men possessed, whether they were delivered or whether they were tortured and killed. This is what it looks like. So how does the young man respond to mom? I mean, this is the biggest gun that that the Antichrist could have pulled out. Well, in verse 30, while she was still speaking, the young man said, what are you waiting for? I will not obey the king's command, but I will obey the command of the Torah that was given to our ancestors through Moshe. Verse uh, 31, but you who have contrived all sorts of evil against the Hebrews will certainly not escape the hands of God, for we are suffering because of our own sins. Here you have the youngest son, and he recognizes the reason this this spirit of Antichrist was able to come in like a flood and to have the power he had was because of the people's sin. You want to know why the spirit of Antichrist is going to rise in this world? is because the door to allow him to come in and govern with such power is us falling away from the Lord. It's sin. And here he recognizes, he confesses, it's because of our own sin. I got to take you to Micah because this guy is just like pulling from the prophet Micah. Micah 7 verse 8 says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise. This is exactly what this young man is telling Antiochus. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Why? Because I have sinned against him. Exactly what this young man has come to the table with is exactly what we read here in Micah. Until he pleads my case and executes judgment for me, he will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. It will happen. And so continuing on, listening to this young man. For our brothers, after enduring a brief suffering, have drunk of ever-flowing life. They've drank of everlasting life. This is amazing. Under God's covenant, but you, by the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. See, this brother knows where his brothers are and what they have done. He knows that they're going to resurrect. He knows they're going to have all eternity. But for him, he's as good as dead. Verse 37. I, like my brothers, give up body and life for the Torah of our ancestors, appealing to God to show mercy soon to our nation and by trials and plagues to make you confess that he alone is God. Isn't that amazing? by trials and plague to make you confess. Do you realize the kid is prophesying? This young man is prophesying, basically telling you exactly what the book of Revelation says, where where the Lord is going to pour out his judgments, his bowls of wrath. Uh, These things, these trumpet blasts are going to go forth, and he is going to show himself. He's going to show himself strong to make the world confess that he alone is God. In fact, it came time... Go back to our story and pass the Passover story and, and the Exodus out of Egypt. Yeah, the magicians they, they they you know they mimicked these first couple miracles that Moses and Aaron performed or that the Lord performed through his prophets until the third one, and they couldn't even stand before Pharaoh after that. They couldn't mimic it. They knew, and it actually says they knew it was the finger of God. And so this is the reality that's going to come. This is the reality what this young man understands is going to happen because there is a time coming that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is Lord. It is coming. Verse 39. The king fell into a rage. See, because when you don't do things his way, he absolutely flips out and loses it. And handled him worse than the others. How is that even possible? I mean, how much more excruciating and medieval can you get on people? 
being exasperated at his scorn, so he died in his integrity, putting his whole trust in the Lord. And it wasn't just him that died. If you read the story, the mom also was killed in this. And she died in her integrity. And man, does this story honor her. She was an honorable woman. And actually, the king took the mother with the children, something that's prohibited in Torah, even amongst the animals. You don't take the mother with their young. This is what the Antichrist does, because everything that is good and holy, he has to do the opposite. He's pure rebellion, the essence of pure evil. Here's what I want you to take away from this. Unless you have faith like these men, unless you have faith like the apostles, unless you have faith like all these men and women mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, you have this kind of resolve, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to make it in this generation. Because persecution is coming. All the signs, this, this, this spirit of the Antichrist, and it's coming to power, uh, great authority, uh, it plays over and over again throughout history. And those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. All you need to do is see this play out again. You can see it right in front of your face right now. It's at the door. It's even at the door right now. And so we, we need to have this kind of resolve of all these uh, beautiful men and women that we've been uh, reading about. I want to share a recent headline to show you how close we really are. And, and without exaggeration, I could show you hundreds of things where we see a, this country has taken a turn a page has turned, if you will, in how America views Christians, in how America views Jews. Isn't it interesting that both Jews and Christians are becoming the product of that which is despised? And this article just came across my desk, and I, I just had to share it with you. This is from The Federalist, and the headline is, Coronavirus is Christian's Fault. And just so you know, the Jews are getting blamed for this. So here we have Jews and Christians are at fault for the coronavirus spirit of Antichrist. It's here. And it goes on. The bigotry didn't get much clearer than a glaring New York Times headline. Listen to this headline that was, that was ran in the New York Times. The road to coronavirus hell was paved by evangelicals. Can't even make that up. Now the article goes on. And the, and the article was written by this Kylie Zempel. And she writes, the March 27th article, uh, the title of which was later changed to The Religious Rights Hostility to Science is Crippling Our Coronavirus Response. And so it's almost like they want to soften the blow. Let's just call it the religious uh, right. And, and in other words, you know, this is stuff even in, within government terms. Uh, the religious right, the religious conservatives are, are being categorized with terrorists. And I'm not even making that up. But this is, this is where we're at. And you have to see what's coming. And when you know what's coming, my biggest concern is this. You need to be prepared. You need to be ready. You need to have a relationship with the Lord Yeshua. Because if you don't, it's going to be the end of it. There is going to be no hope for you. And if you think everything that we read today was bad... Pretty much the last thing that's on my you know, bucket list to do is to, to end my life like that. That is nothing compared to the judgment of Yeshua. So if you think that's bad, that's nothing. The judgment of the Lord is far more terrifying. And that is certainly something you do not want to see. And so let's get back to Hebrews. we got to finish Hebrews out. Chapter 11, verse 35, this is what we read. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. And of course, uh, you know, you can read about stuff like this right in the book of Acts. Yeshua's apostles were, were persecuted. They were imprisoned. Peter was in prison. Paul was in prison. Paul was w w received 40 stripes minus one five times. He was beaten with rods three times. We could go on. I mean, this stuff was happening in the first century even. 
uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. They were stoned. Think about Stephen. Paul was stoned. He didn't die. He made it through it. But Stephen was stoned. He didn't make it through it. Stephen died. He had this incredible vision of Yeshua as he's being killed. And then it says, they were sawn in two. I mean, you want to talk about grotesque way to die. A vile way to die. This is it. And here's the thing. I know who the writer of Hebrews, at least one of the primary guys he has in his mind is without question, it is Isaiah the prophet. And the reason I say that is because Isaiah was sawn in two. I mean, here we read, we read about all these beautiful, amazing prophecies about the Messiah Yeshua and the hope and the redemption and the forgiveness. It's where it's all at. And this prophet that brought all these powerful and beautiful message, messages, he died a horrific death. In fact, to help give you a little insight, I want to take you and show you some traditional writing on this. And this is a Jewish Christian writing that dates back to the first uh, early second century. It's called the Ascension of Isaiah. And it records a lot of what happened with Isaiah, this interaction with Isaiah and Manasseh, this wicked king, uh, which we know is in the Bible. And uh, Manasseh, remember, um, the son of Hezekiah. Well, l- well, let me just show you. We'll go through this and I'll explain something as we go. But Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 6. Now this is, if you're not familiar with the Ascension of Isaiah, this is part of the Pseudepigrapha. This is outside the canon of, of our Bible. Uh, with that disclaimer, let's let's look at this. And Belchira. Belchira is a prophet, but a false prophet. Belchira, let's call him the false prophet, accused Yeshayahu or Isaiah and the prophets, and these would be the prophets that sided with Isaiah, that hung out with Isaiah, who were with him, saying, Isaiah and those who are with him prophesy against Jerusalem and against the cities of Judah that they shall be laid waste which he did, and Isaiah ha- himself has said, I see more than Moses the prophet. But Moses said, No man can see God and live. And Isaiah has said, I have seen God, and behold, I live. Now, I want you to see something here, and this is one of the reasons I, I wanted you to see this story, to understand this backdrop to Isaiah, this interaction between this false prophet, Bilhira, and Isaiah, a true prophet. Notice what the spirit of Antichrist did. And this is, this is pivotal to this. He comes in and he uses the Torah to condemn Isaiah. And he actually quotes the passage. He doesn't even distort the passage. He's using it in distorted context. But he comes out and quotes it as is. He quotes uh, the Torah saying that no one can see God and live. You can read this in the book of Exodus. All right? And it's true. It says it. But we know as you get to Isaiah in chapter 6, he goes, uh, that he sees the Lord sitting on his throne. He is high and lifted up that his own eyes have seen the king of glory or the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah says this and Belchira comes on the scene and says, you're a liar because the Torah says this. Torah says, no man can see God and live. And you, you say you live, so you're a liar. Now, I point this out because do you see how clever and seductive and manipulative the enemy is. Again, he doesn't have a conscience. He doesn't, have, he doesn't ever say to himself, oh, I couldn't go that far. I, I couldn't do that to somebody. He is the most wicked and vile enemy the world has ever known. The schemer of schemers, the father of lies, And he will use scripture. As we've seen, he was willing to do against Yeshua. You've heard me say it many times. He will absolutely try with you. He absolutely tried with Yeshayahu, with the prophet Isaiah. He tried to twist him. tried to to put a bad name on him through the Torah. And through a statement that in and of itself is true. That no man can see God and live. But there are certainly times that men had seen God. Uh, and survived f- for God's purpose. Okay? Uh, let's move on. Verse 10. 
Know therefore, O king, and okay, so this is Belchira, the false prophet, petitioning Manasseh, Manasseh, right? And, and he's in Manasseh's camp, so he's kind of buddy-buddy with them, that he is lying. In other words, Isaiah is lying. And Yerushalayim also he hath called Sodom. And the princes of Judah and Yerushalayim he hath declared to the people of Gomorrah. And uh, read, read Isaiah 1. Yes, he did say this. And do you see how upset they are? How dare this man come on the scene and start saying that our city, which God has given us, Yerushalayim, is going to be destroyed. How dare this guy come on the scene and tell us that we're men of Sodom and we're men of Gore and knowing that God destroyed them. But we're the people of God. And so the same thing happened to Jeremiah the prophet that we see happening here. And I'm going to tell you this, the same thing is going to happen at the end of the age, the very generation we're in. The enemy is going to come in. He's going to attempt to use the Torah to pervert the truth. And there's so many aspects of the Hebrew roots that is just so filled with the spirit of Antichrist. It's not even funny. It's frightening, actually. And all these guys uh, touting polygamy and all this nonsense and essentially attempting to use the Torah, lift up the Torah. Oh, the Torah says this, and all these men, Abraham and, and Yaakov, they, they had these multiple wives. Don't tell me that it doesn't matter. Torah even gives prescriptions for multiple wives without even recognizing what the call by God is, the holy calling of God is going back to the garden. It's perverse. This is perversity. Okay, where am I? Uh, verse 10. Um... And he brought many accusations against Isaiah and the prophets before Manasseh. Who's the accuser? It's the devil. Expect the Antichrist to behave this way. Verse 11. But Belier, and I want to be clear, this is a demon. This is a demonic spirit. This is the spirit of Antichrist. This is, this is a play off of Belia all. The spirit, a demonic spirit that's without prophet. It's a statement. Belia all is a, is a, is a name for a demon. So, Belier dwelt in the heart of Manasseh. I mean, you think of a demon dwelling in the heart. And that's why he was so utterly vile and wicked. And that's why he was a warlock. And that's why he did what he did, burning his children to Molech. And in the heart of the princes of Yehuda and Benjamin, and of the eunuchs, and of the uh, counselors of the king, and the words of Belchira pleased him, and he sent and seized Isaiah. So you see when the spirit of Antichrist, these demons, they, they have such great influence. And you just think of, of Proverbs 17, 4, and, and it helps me understand what's going on in the world and how all these people can listen to this media and drink the Kool-Aid and actually believe half of the stuff that's being reported. It's just, it's, it's ludicrous. But then you remember an evildoer gives heed to false lips and a liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. In other words, when people don't have Yeshua living in their heart, they don't have truth. It's easy to believe the lie. That's a reality. Now moving on. And he sawed him asunder with a wood saw. I mean, this is just absolutely vile. This beautiful and holy and faithful prophet who saw the king of glory being sawn in two. And when Isaiah was being sawn in sunder, Belchira stood up, accusing him, and all the false prophets stood up, laughing and rejoicing because of Isaiah. You cannot make this stuff up and understand something. The spirit of the Antichrist gets intoxicated by the blood of the saints. Look at the harlot who sits on the beast. Go and read it. She's intoxicated with the blood of the saints, laughing and giggling. It's demonic. And this is what happens as this holy and beautiful man of God is suffering. The demonic realm is giggling. It's just, it's just so filthy wrong. There are, again, no words. Moving to verse 8, jumping ahead. And Belchira spake thus to Isaiah, Say what I say unto thee, and I will turn their heart and I will compel Manasseh and the princes of Yehuda and the people of all Yerushalayim to reverence thee. In other words, is, is this a sound familiar? The, the devil's willing to strike a deal here. If you just basically call good evil and evil good, you do what I say, we're not going to have any problems. We're going to be okay. 
I'll make sure they start accepting you and everything's going to be fine. We'll restore you. And Isaiah answered and said, So far as I have utterance, I say, Damned and accursed be thou and all thy powers and all thy house, for thou canst not take from me aught save the skin of my body. In other words, you can't do me any harm. There's nothing you can do. You can destroy this flesh, but I'm going to resurrect. Uh, you can't kill me. And I just think, uh, again, of Yeshua's words in Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear him who can, can, who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Isaiah listened to the words of Yeshua. In fact, I'll take it a step further. If you, you read Isaiah carefully uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, you will discover Isaiah, when he saw the Lord of hosts, he saw Yeshua. That's who he saw. So he knew him quite well, quite intimately, shall we say. Verse 11. And they seized and sawn in sunder Isaiah, the son of Amoz, with a wood saw and Manasseh and Belchira and the false prophets and the princes and the people all stood looking on. Verse 13. And to the prophets who were with him, he said before he had been sawn in sunder, Go ye to the region of Tyre and Sidon for me. Only hath God mingled the cup. Now, for me only hath God mingled the cup. And so you look at this, basically, what is Isaiah saying? He's, okay, all his prophet buddies, he's telling them, go, go away, go to Tyre and Sidon. The Lord's only appointed me to die, but not appointed to you. And so this, again, going back to Hebrews 11, you got some people, they're going to receive deliverance, and some people who are not, that they might obtain a better Resurrection, and I assure you, Isaiah will receive a better resurrection like that of John the Baptist. Verse 14 And when Isaiah was being sawn in sunder, he neither cried aloud nor wept, but his lips spake with the Holy Spirit until he was sawn in twain. And so, as we look at what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, that some were stoned and some were sawn in two, yeah, Isaiah is one of them. And his story mirrors that of the stories that we read in the Maccabees with Eliezer and with these seven brothers, these awesome men and women of God that were willing to die for the faith. Now the writer of Hebrews goes on and says, these men were tempted. They weren't just tempted, but they were slain with the sword. And we can even read in Acts chapter 12, right? Yaakov or James, he was slain with the sword, one of the sons of Zebedee. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. You know, this is a very dis different description than what you would get out of the prosperity gospel and how everybody's supposed to be wealthy and prosperous and have all the desires of their heart. And this is how you know you're walking in the beautiful grace of God and the favor of God is on your life. And yet you read a passage like this and you're like, what are you talking about? There are many, many, many righteous men who went about being destitute. They were penniless. They were broke. They were afflicted and they're tormented. That's a reality of the faith. The apostles... This, they were a great example of this. Isaiah is a great example of this. Zechariah is a great example. John the Baptist, we could go on, right? And you think of sheepskins and goatskins, and actually this is a reference uh, most likely, and we, we can read this in one of the early uh, writings of Clement, First Clement, that it refers to Elijah and Elisha. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, and as we know, Elijah wore a leather belt, etc., uh, verse 38, and so did John the Baptist. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Verse 39. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith. How are we going to obtain a good testimony? There's only one way. I tell you this. There's only one way. And that is faith. You can't obtain a good testimony of faith without faith. You can't obtain salvation without faith. You can't obtain healing without faith. You can't obtain uh, being victorious over the world, as First John tells us, without faith. Faith is the most essential thing 
we must have. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God. See, it all begins with faith, and true faith culminates love. The highest of heights, it brings faith full circle. Love brings full circle the beautiful thing of faith. They did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they... Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so here's the amazing thing that the writer gets to is all these awesome men and women that have died for the faith, they're not going to resurrect apart from us. We're all, there's going to be this universal, we've already covered this, this universal resurrection where all God's children are going to be going to rise up at once. It is going to be, yeah, mind-blowing, uh, to say the least. Now, finally, coming to the end of Hebrews chapter 11, getting through that chapter. Some of you thought we, I'd never do it, but here we've crossed the finish line. But to go back to the introduction of what I talked about today, Uh, Let me pose the question, what does any of this have to do with Passover? As I alluded to, I mean, this this whole back end of, of Hebrews chapter 11 is about Passover. It's the perfect message for Passover. Why would I say that? What does it have to do with Pesach? Well, a lot more than you might um, think. Going to Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, we read this. Observe the month of Aviv. And keep the Pesach to the Lord your God. For in the month of Aviv, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Pesach to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. In other words, guess what? You don't get to sacrifice the Pesach lamb outside of Jerusalem. It could only be sacrificed there. Now, moving on to verse 3, we read this. Oh, I skipped it. There you go. You shall eat no unleavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. Okay, so here we actually have the command, hey, we're supposed to eat unleavened bread. And obviously we start that today and we do this for seven days. We eat from the 15th to the 21st. Now here's where it gets interesting. As we continue, we're going to discover a particular name for this bread. And what is that? That is the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. So every year at this time of Pesach, we're given this reminder. Every year we eat the bread, the lechem oni in Hebrew. We're given this bread of affliction, and it reminds us of the following, that you may remember the day. We can never forget. We remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. Now, if you, if you remember the Exodus, it was a hellish experience for the children of Israel. I want you to understand something. When Moses and Aaron came to them, as I alluded to before, and said, let my people go to Pharaoh, Pharaoh immediately responded as the spirit of Antichrist would, the devil would, And he doubled down on the affliction, absolutely afflicting, oppressing, and tormenting them to a degree that they had never experienced before. Make no mistake about it. They were eating the bread of affliction. And so, but again, as that happened, as it got more intense, what happened? They got delivered. There was deliverance for them. And so every year we come to this time, we are to recall that very event. But not just that event. We're to recall another event. And we get this from Yeshua in Luke 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So... Here you, again, the first exodus, you have uh, the Lord taking them out of Egypt. And the reason we celebrate Pesach 
is because of that. But then Yeshua comes on the scene and says, whoa, whoa, time out. All of this, even what you've been celebrating, is about me. And what do we know about him? What did he do? Do this in remembrance of me. We're never to forget what he did for us on the cross. The price that he paid, the great sacrifice. He was afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace. It was upon him. And it's by his stripes that we are healed. Now, let me take this a step further because this all has to do with the bread of affliction. It all has to do with the persecution I've talked about all today. As we go back to 1 Peter 4, which I've quoted multiple times, Therefore, Since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You understand? So that affliction and that suffering that Yeshua gave himself so that we could be saved, we are to arm ourselves with the same mind. We are to assume the bread of affliction. We are to partake of that. If any of you went through the baptism series, you know one of the things that I mentioned in traditional Judaism, when anyone, any Gentile was going to come in and convert, one of the things that they would tell you, they would warn you, do you understand that you are coming into a persecuted family? That we're a nation that is extremely persecuted. And all you need to do is look at the history of Israel. And there's no mystery here. They're an extremely persecuted people. Highly afflicted. You need to know this before you come in and convert. And if the convert, yes, I understand. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go through the mikvah and I'm going to get this circumcision. And then there's full conversion. But that's one of the requirements for them to understand. This is a requirement I think we forget Because you get soft in America. We all do. We all get soft in America thinking that, you know, we're not called to be afflicted when in fact that's exactly we're called to pick up our cross and follow him to die to ourselves. Paul again says, I die daily. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this Passover, (laughs) we have a lot of time to ponder. One of the things you need to be thinking about is this bread of affliction. When we eat this matzah, when we eat that, we are eating, we are agreeing to lose our life for the sake of his. We are agreeing that if the Lord so chooses to call us to an Isaiah moment, to a seven brothers moment, to an Eliezer moment, to a Zechariah moment, to John the Baptist moment, to a Paul or a Peter. If he calls us to that moment, we've agreed to eat this bread. We're willing to eat the bread of affliction because of what Yeshua did for us. That is the agreement. It's called coming into covenant with Yeshua, confessing him as Lord and Savior, and being willing to go to wherever we need to go. Some of us may not face martyrdom. Some of us may be tortured. Some of us may be imprisoned. The Lord knows your future. He has your path marked out. The big thing is, is you need to be willing to eat that bread. That's the bread we've been given. I'm going to close here for today. I just want to thank you for joining us again. Happy Passover. Um, The Lord is is so faithful at this time. This message, not intended to scare you at all, this message is intended to strengthen you. And so I'm just going to close in prayer. Abba Father, I just give you praise and glory. We give you praise and glory for your word, for the truth of your word, for the strength that you give us through your word. It is truly living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we thank you that the word became flesh. Because had it not, we would have no life. We would have no hope. We would have no salvation. We'd have no victory, no forgiveness. We'd have nothing. To you, Lord Yeshua, we ascribe all greatness, the one who really bore our sins. You were innocent, Lord. We deserve to die. You did not deserve to die. You did nothing wrong. This perfect, spotless lamb. 
And so we just give you praise and glory, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for what you did for us. And may that great sacrifice that you made be always before us, that we are willing to partake of the bread of affliction, to be able to do it with joy and thanksgiving, and to be able to proclaim the name of Yeshua to the world in boldness without fear. And we just pray this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Please stay tuned uh, for Pastor Craig uh, as he's going to lead us in some prayer. Bless you.